In this second video of the Nature of Knowledge series, I want us to explore epistemology and ontology from the point of view of how useful they're going to be to you in the particular field of studies that you want to achieve. Now, hopefully you've already accessed one of the little Spark videos that looked at um, epistemology, the study of ways of thinking about knowledge. And um, I'm hoping then that you'll have a good understanding now of what epistemology is. Remember, check out websites like etymonline.com to see the etymology of those words, and then just start exploring the word. And especially when you look at different research methods, books, if you just dip into them and look in the various chapters on epistemologies, ontologies, philosophy, uh, that's relevant to research studies, and especially for those um, that, that are applicable across health. And that's what we'll focus on more in this video, how it's applicable both to health and to social care. There's a quote from the feminist author Alessandra uh, Tanasini, where she says, epistemology delineates the necessary conditions under which knowledge is possible. And if you stop and think about that, think and reflect about it, think about the way in which epistemology is giving us a framework within which to understand the things that we know. And not just the things that we know, but how we know them, and actually how we say that we know them. Now, when it comes to the world of healthcare in particular, and especially uh, studies from the medical model or the medical paradigm, you'll often notice that quite a few of those, or most of those, are actually positivist or post-positivist studies. And again, when I'm using these two different terms, it's worth checking out the differences to those. So when... Um, science was first being developed after the Enlightenment, people saw it in a particular way, thought, right, this is science, this is truth, this is how we understand things. And if we don't understand something yet, if we haven't discovered something or found something yet, then we obviously haven't invented the research in which to do it. And that was often seen as positivism. And there are some negative elements with positivism. And therefore, more modern authors on this would now often describe themselves as being post-positivists because they've taken on the critique of positivism and they've tried to do things about it, especially in relation to um, reflexivity and being reflective in their studies and also in challenging the whole notion of something called truth and the whole notions around something called objectivity. Okay? But in traditional uh, medical research, especially when you're reading articles that maybe talk about randomised control trials, for example, a lot of that has been built up from a biomedical uh, model, and it does tend to look at objectivity as if to say, well, the researcher can completely stand back from that which they're researching. But where post-positivism comes in, and certainly in qualitative studies, when they're looking at uh, um, research as being uh, reflective, then it means we even have to reflect ourselves on well, how possible is it for us to stand back. And if we are standing back, if we are saying that we're being objective, how objective are we being if even the parameters of what we design say, um, in, a, in a questionnaire or a survey, how do we know that we're therefore encapsulating everything that we need to be looking at and not just focusing on what we as individuals think will be important? Because if we're only going to focus on the things we think are important, then we're not being objective, no matter how objective we say we're trying to be. And I'll come on to that in a little while later. Also, with uh, quantitative studies in particular, they'll talk about being genera generalizable. So um, doing studies of huge populations, maybe national surveys, the census is a typical example of this. So by doing a census of people, you're capturing so many that you can then say, well, this is probably reflective of the whole population. Now, qualitative research never makes the claim. And I notice sometimes with uh, bachelor students when they're doing their dissertations, they might read some qualitative research and they say, oh, but this study was only looking at 20 individuals on focus groups and therefore it's not generalizable. Well, qualitative research never makes the claim that it's going to be generalizable. So there's no point in saying that at all. So quantitative studies would, because they're looking at large numbers 
and large is better, um, if they're wanting to extrapolate out of that the relevance to certain populations. And also with, uh, uh, with, with positivist and post-positivist studies, especially the way in which writing them up means that they can be replicate, replicated by other people. Even when you hear of things like meta-analyses, for example, where it's a case of some systematic reviews have been done of certain topics, and then a meta-analysis is an over-analysis. So they would take the data from each of the individual studies and then run it all as one big data set. So uh, from that point of view, every step of the research has to be uh, written about in such a way that if somebody wanted to replicate it, they could. And if there are steps missing, then that would be considered to be poor research methodology. So a typical uh, a quantitative study that you may hear of is a randomized control trial, especially when you're reading medical journals so many of the studies would be uh, uh, published from RCTs because in quantitative research it is seen as the gold standard of research studies and again sometimes people are writing up on qualitative research and they might say oh well RCTs are the, the gold standard but I can't do that in this case as if to say that their research is less because it's not seen to be this gold standard. But it's only the gold standard if you're using the quantitative paradigm and if that's the type of thing that you're trying to explore. But when you look at the particular pyramid that's shown here, and there are quite a few different ones, but on this one here, right at the bottom of this hierarchy, it shows clinical experience and anecdote. And that's seen as the lowest level. So it's not as good as randomized control trials. And yet, if you were doing your study from a qualitative point of view, that may be your starting point. So say, for example, if you're working with clients, patients, service users, whatever terms you're using, and you notice that a certain number of them keep on saying similar things to you. So that's clinical experience or anecdote. You're hearing this as anecdotal evidence. But then out of that, you may then, you may then say, well, look, I'm hearing this so often, I think I need to explore this in more detail. And that's where you then may be designing your research studies. So whether it's enough to go for a randomised control trial, if it's quantitative research you want to look at, or at this stage you may be saying, well, no, I want to know why people are saying this. So it's not so much counting how many people say it, but why they're experiencing what they say they're experiencing. Okay, so even when you're talking about the different types of studies, and especially when it comes to the, um, the MSc in advanced clinical practice and the MA in healthcare practice, some of you may be looking at re retrospective studies as well. And you're going to have a look back. So say, for example, if you're doing um, a service evaluation or an audit, and what you want to do, you're not designing a study that's going to run now, or into the future, you're not doing it that way, but you're looking back. So it could be that you're looking at patient notes over the last X number of years to see how many times certain things are mentioned. And that's why even taking notes is really important. So accuracy is going to be important there because people can miss out on it. Let me give you one very quick personal example here. Uh, my husband went into A&E a few years ago, and when he was clerked by the, uh, uh, the admin person, uh, she wrote down all the different details, and he came and sat down next to me, and I asked to see what she'd written down. And she said that he was a type 1 diabetic, so the word diabetic wasn't spelled properly. So if anyone's trying to do a retrospective study, and you want to pull all the notes on people with type 1 diabetes, this one would have been missed, because it wasn't even categorised properly. Okay, so it's really important for note taking purposes to make sure that the language is accurate, correct, and understandable to others. And then in retrospective studies, you can actually be looking at this. But you may even be looking at it over a period of time. Say, for example, written notes now go on to computerized notes. So is there a difference in the quality or the quantity of information that's now gathered? Maybe that's what you're interested in. So retrospective studies looking back over time. So the clear emphasis in epistemological questioning is to ask questions behind the very questions. So it's not just looking at what is being asked, 
but try to understand well, why are you asking that in the first place? Um, and even by asking that question, why are you asking it? Uh, you could be exploring other questions, sort of how are you asking it? What's the relevance of asking it? Could you have asked it in a different way? Who are you including by this? Who are you excluding? So epistemology is getting us to think about all these various types of questions that, that, that will actually build up to a very robust research study. With post-positivist research, of course, um, there, there's often been the claim that they want to go for um, scientific objectivity. They want the researcher to be detached from what's being researched. And that uh, detachment also means an objectification of it as well. So you're categorising people or categorising phenomena that happen. You're putting them into pigeonholes and boxes so that you can see them from a detached point of view. Because one thing that post-positivist research really dislikes that may um, accidentally or occasionally happen in some types of um, qualitative research especially ethnographic research, is there's a claim that sometimes people can live the experience of the people they're researching for so long that they may end up going native. And that's the term that's often used. And that would be seen as research contamination from a purist, objective research point of view. But then there are other researchers, especially in the qualitative domains, who would say that objectivity is a chimera. It's a mythological creature that never even existed, save in the imaginations of those who believe that knowing can be separated from the knower. And it's when you read books like this on research methods, and especially exploring the, uh, the epistemologies, Come out with little quotes like this. Remember these because they can be full of insight and have great impact on the message that you're trying to get across with your research studies. So when it comes to epistemology and asking questions behind the questions, as you'll see in the later video as well, it's really important to consider those who are hidden or invisibilized but not just to consider that somebody is hidden. So out of your statistics, for example, it may be that certain people are hidden out of these, but qualitative research, especially from an epistemological point of view, would then get you question, well, why are they missing? How are they missing? What's the impact on them being missing? What's the impact on those who are included? That's where your epistemological questioning is coming in. Now, um, one of the key uh, messages I often talk about in relation to sexual health studies is the, uh, the, the the whole aspect of HIV statistics. So whichever scientist came out with the idea of categorising people by the mode of transmission, right from those early days of HIV, back in the 1980s, whoever came up with the list of modes of transmission categories put them down as, using the language that was used then, homosexual transmission, heterosexual transmission, um, mother to child, blood or blood products, injecting drug use, or others. Now the others could be people that just weren't categorized and therefore they didn't come into any of those, so they were just dumped into that one. So who or what goes into the others? But when you look at these other categories, even when it says homosexual male, now it's talking about MSM, men who have sex with men. So that is talking about um, the, the physical activity of what's happening. So it's not saying about somebody's orientation, it's not saying gay men, for example, because not all gay men are having sex. So therefore they wouldn't be coming in those statistics for HIV if they haven't acquired or transmitted the virus. So it's talking about MSM, so it's talking about activities. But all MSM are now listed in one big category. But when you look at the male to female categories, that's now split down over different ethnicities. And the impact you can get, or two, two key impacts here. One is that it doesn't look half as big as the man-to-man -man transmission, because it's split into various other transmission categories, uh, um, because, because of ethnicities. So it's misleading from that point of view, but also 
it can give you the impression that if you're white, heterosexual and male living in the UK, chances of getting HIV are really small for you. So it's broken it down on ethnicities. But epistemologically, we need to ask, well, why? What's the impact of that? What's it saying about one group? And what is it giving other people um, a green light to think about? So very different approaches there. Because in the early days of HIV, one could argue that lots of the MSM group actually had it by sex abroad. Um, quite often with Americans or with people from other parts of the world. So if you had broken down the MSM category by, you know, white at home sort of thing, or those who have had sex abroad, it would have given a very different picture. So the picture is being painted by the very categories being used. And yet whoever thought up those categories in the first place probably thought they were being very scientific and objective. But when you look at those categories again, you'll realise that there's one group of people completely missing on there, and that's lesbian and bisexual females. So then you ask the questions, well, how many lesbians have got HIV? Well, by looking at the statistics, you don't know, because nobody ever asked the question. So if you're not asking the question, does that mean that there aren't any lesbians living with HIV? Now, the, pic the reason why I've got a picture of Queen Victoria here is because a lot of this stems back to her day and age, back in 1861, when male homosexuality um, was criminalised, apparently Queen Victoria couldn't countenance the idea that women would have sex together. And therefore, she scratched out any reference to lesbians. So until 2003, lesbians have never been a legal category. Okay, until the Sexual Offences Act of 2003, which gave the equal age of consent to everyone at 16. And that's the first time in law that lesbians have been mentioned. So the very fact they're not mentioned means that they're invisibilized, they're hidden. Or then again, when you look at the impact of language, when I said that one of the other categories that is mother to child transmission, and that's still the term that's quite often used by um, UN AIDS, for example, the United Nations AIDS Organization, but lots of people today say that's not the right terminology to be using. Because if you talk about mother to child, then it's very much a blame game. If you talk about vertical transmission, then that's quite objective. You're just talking top down, okay? But mother to child is morally loaded. But also, if you're just going to talk mother to child, supposing that mother acquired the infection from the partner that got her pregnant, then if you're only concentrating, so say you're working in midwifery services, and you're concentrating solely on mother and child, mother and child, and nobody's considering him outside the door, because he might be thinking, well, it was me that passed the virus on to my wife, or my girlfriend, my partner, and now it's gone to our child as well. So he may be feeling horrendous guilt, thinking, well, it all stemmed with him. So it's really important when we're thinking epistemologically, we challenge the very words we say. So even if you use concepts like mother to child, who is that including and who is it excluding? So it's important, especially in health and social care, to consider people who are being invisibilised. And even our research may be having a compounding effect on invisibilising people. Epistemology and ontology also tap into so many of the ethical debates that we have in the health and social care worlds. You'll see a few of them coming up here. I won't go through each one individually, but just think about some of the huge existence, existential questions that we may ask. When does life begin? Now, some people would say life begins at the moment of fertilisation. So the minute a sperm gets inside an ovum, that's when life begins. The World Health Organisation has a different view and says, no, it's when implantation into the uterus takes place. Now, that's going to be really important because if somebody's considering a medical treatment like emergency contraception, if a person believes that life begins at fertilisation, then to them, emergency contraception is an abortifacient. It's causing abortion. And yet the World Health Organization would say, well, no, it isn't, because pregnancy hasn't started. Pregnancy does not start 
until implantation has taken place. And therefore, emergency contraception is before pregnancy starts. Therefore, you can't say that it's an abortion. Now, see, just on that one sentence alone, we can start playing around with all different aspects of this. And people's morals and ethics, as we'll see later in the course, they can have huge implications, especially in research studies as well. But also, if you're considering the end of life, so when we come to debates about um, physician-assisted suicide, or euthanasia, or whether it's right and proper to turn a patient in their last few hours of life just to do pressure area care. All of these are ethical questions and considerations that will have an impact on the type of research you might want to frame. I'll post this whole list on the wider Spark page so you can work through those at your own time then. A really good position to take, rather than just focusing on one particular aspect of research, saying, oh, I want to do quantitative research, or I want to do qualitative research, or I want to look at it from a feminist point of view. Rather than do that, you can use what's referred to as a research bricolage, a French word meaning all the bricks going together. You can use lots of um, uh, distinct, as it says here, distinct and sometimes competing uh, academic traditions, so that you can actually challenge the, the monolith, the, the, the one notion that well, there's only one way to do it, and this is the right way and every other way is wrong. Now that's a hegemonic knowledge. So remember that word uh, hegemony, an ancient Greek word that means power, but lots of feminist authors have spoken about it from the point of view of a negative power. And there is this monolith, monolithic hegemony of cultural representations that see power in healthcare as you can only do it that way and not other ways. So it's really going to be important that you challenge this, especially when you think back to the earlier slide of people who invisibilized. If you're just going to go down the mainstream route, you may still carry on perpetuating, missing out so many others. So develop your own research bricolage. And I want to give you an example of this one here. So when I did my own doctorate, um, I particularly wanted to look at the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And if you're looking over my head, that's him on the wall there. Um, I wanted to look at Michel Foucault because he'd written a few volumes of a, a, what's called the history of sexuality. And it was quite um, a classic study at the time, very, very influential and important because lots of stuff has been spurned off, uh, uh, come out from him since those original studies, whether in agreement or even disagreement with him. So I wanted to look at Foucault. But I'd also done two years of feminist studies at the Gender Institute at the LSE. So I thought well, it's going to be important as well, because I'm focusing on sexual health, obviously I've got to look at women's issues. And Foucault, like Marx, has often been accused, especially by feminists, of not including women enough in what he writes about, especially in relation to sexuality. So I thought, well, I need to counterbalance Foucault with uh, feminism, but also the talk about Foucault's method. So what's Foucault's method? Well, actually, he said, well, he didn't have one. He's dead now, so he can't say it. But in, in his writings, he said that he didn't have a particular method. What he described was he built a toolbox of all different methods and he encouraged people to go in and just take what's appropriate for you. If this helps you, use it. If it doesn't help you, don't. And that's part of this bricolage um, and starting to build things together. But even when you're talking about feminism, there are different what's called waves of feminism. There are feminists in the centre, feminists on the extremes, on the outside, on the margins. There are all these different types of feminisms. So I should have put an S on the end of that. So which type of feminism is it you're going to be looking at? Okay. And then obviously if I'm looking at feminism, and that gender isn't just about feminists and women's issues, but it's about men's issues as well. So I thought, well, by looking at feminist texts, I also need to counterbalance that with looking at some masculinity studies as well. And then two other approaches. Back in the 1960s, there was lots of uh, texts being written and people talking about gay and lesbian studies. And they often come from what's called an essentialist point of view, which means um, similar to ethnicities. So when you look at the, um, uh, the breakdown in race relations, 
in certain nations of the world, especially in the United States of America up until the early 60s. And then when you had the black rights movement and looking at racial equality, okay, when all those movements started to come through, so emancipation for feminists, um, equality for people of different ethnicities, that's when some lesbian and gay authors started writing to say, well, look, from the point of view of our um, orientation, we're equal to heterosexuals. So a lot of them have gone down this route of what's called immutability. You can't change it, okay? Like, I can't change the colour of my skin. That's what immutability means. You just can't change it. So they went down the route of immutability, just like ethnicity and race studies went down the route of we can't change the colour of our skin, okay? And yet we are equal. But then, especially because of some of the stuff that Foucault had written, there were other theorists that then started writing, especially in the early 90s, and they came out with something they, they called queer theory. Now, queer theory and feminism in particular would be categorised as critical theories. So they really do help you to critique everything that you're thinking about and reading. There's one fantastic little book I've got on my shelves um, upstairs called The Trouble with Normal. So even when you use language like that, so well, look, in my research studies, I was looking at one whole group of people, and these are the norm. But what do you mean by normal? What's the opposite of normal? It's going to be abnormal or subnormal. Okay? If you use a word like natural, what's the opposite to natural? It's unnatural. So the very language we use, queer theory, would question all of this. And queer theory even questioned the gay and lesbian studies people Say, well, why do you even need to categorise yourself like this? Whether your orientation is immutable, whether it's changeable, whatever, why are you bothered? Because they would critique the very need to categorise yourself in the first place. And even when you think of things like what's now referred to as equal marriage in many countries, such as the UK, and some gay and lesbian people would say, well, we won't feel equal to heterosexuals until we've got exactly the same laws as them. And the last hurdle to jump sort of thing was um, marriage. So now as we're able to get married, does that mean we've got full equality? Whereas queer theorists would say, well, look, marriage around the world is the most hegemonic, uh, male over female, it's the most hegemonic uh, um, dyadic relationship. Why would you even want to enter into that institution? So queer theory is constantly going to be asking all of these questions. So there are quite a few opposing themes going on here, but I managed to um, look at them in such a way that they could all contribute to the research studies I was doing. And here's how I managed to do that. So from Foucault's point of view, dipping into his toolbox, if things help, if, if different categories he spoke about or procedures, methods, then I could use those. And one of them in particular was something called a genealogy. So I explored what that meant, especially in relation to um, how things have changed over time. So especially in sexual health, stuff around abortion, teenage pregnancy, homosexuality, lots of those things have changed over time. So it's not just looking, well, how have they changed, but it's looking at the powers and the resistance to that power that's enabled the new ways of us looking at these. When it came to feminism, especially the texts on listening to the margins. So even when people are writing about, you know, people are writing feminist texts, one of the big critiques back in the 70s and 80s was the majority of people writing these had a sort of white Eurocentric approach to them. And lots of the people on the margins were um, people of colour, people of different abilities, um, people of different socioeconomic status, different educational status, uh, queer people, all these different uh, people that didn't feel that they were mainstream were somehow then on the margin. And feminism also challenges this whole notion of biological essentialism. And that's really important, even when you ask a person on a form, are you male or female? That in itself is biologically essentialist. You're saying the world is either male or female. Well, how about people who are not that? Or people who want to challenge that? Or people who don't want to be confined to one or the other? So challenging 
biological essentialism. And that means that it's not just saying, oh, well, men are superior to women because they're stronger, physically stronger than women. It's not saying that. So that's biological essentialism. It's now looking at equality from a totally different perspective. We're different, but equal. When it comes to masculinity studies, that really enabled me to, to shed light on some dark spaces. Because say, for example, if you're working um, as a practice nurse, in general practice, and you might say, well, look, the majority of the patients that come into us are female. The men hardly ever come in. And usually when they do, they've left things so late that their illnesses are really far gone. Now, even when you look at the statistics of people born in Britain, there are usually, most years, there are more males born than females. Yet males die quicker, uh, earlier than females, and many of them die of preventable illnesses or illnesses that had they caught it earlier, something could have been done. So they don't like talking about their feelings. And even when you think of things like, oh, have a stiff up, stiff up a lip, you know, big boys don't cry. These are genderized terms that messages are handed on to children, that boys do one thing, girls do something totally different. Now that's tapping back to that biological essentialism again. And if you're going to be doing that, um, you're going to miss out on all the people in these darkened spaces. So even trying to look at, well, why don't men go to general practice earlier? It's not just a case of saying, well, in the particular area where our general practice is, we find we've got lots of men who go out to work and lots of women are staying home and looking after the children. Now, that's very gender stereotypic, the way I've said it, but that's a traditional way that it was thought, well, general practice is more appropriate for women to go because more of them are at home. But not now in this day and age, where so many women are out to work as well. But then you may ask yourself, well, how many men are on um, contracts? How many women are much poorer because they're suffering under working these zero, zero contract hours? So there's an imbalance going on there. So who's being invisibilized? Who's being marginalized? That's what the epistemology here is helping us to look at. When it comes to the gay and lesbian studies, um, certainly looking at ideas around identities. So when, uh, when you consider a, something called a person's sexuality or their orientation, their, their orientation may be one way. So a person might say, well, look, I'm gay. But the culture in which they live may not allow them to be out about being gay. And therefore, supposing they live in a, in a culture, which could be here even in the UK, it could be they're living in a family from a culture or part of the world where every man has to marry every woman, every woman has to marry every man. And then the parents are going to start nagging you then to start producing grandchildren. So there's this model. So a person may say, well, look, I've, in my heart of hearts, I feel as though I'm gay but I've got to marry a woman because that's what my culture or my religion expects of me. But my attractions, my sexual and erotic attractions are elsewhere. And what my wife doesn't know is my behaviors are elsewhere as well. Okay, so that's why it's really important to know about all these different aspects then. And then looking at the equality of rights. Well, obviously around the world, non-heterosexual people are usually discriminated against, whether that's in law, in practice, in fear for their lives. Okay, so looking at equality. So if you're doing studies, again, who is included and who is excluded? And then with queer theory, yes, it's seen as post-structuralism, look at that term as well, um, especially post-modernist approach to queering what's seen as normative spaces or heteronormative spaces. So if you say, oh, well, in our culture, most men get married to women, but in Wales, where I come from, for example, now the majority of live births are outside of wedlock. So at one point, you would have said, children are normally born within marriage. That's the norm. Now, that's not the norm. The norm is being born outside of wedlock. So even using terminology like this, we constantly need to question it. And that's the end of this next video. So like I keep on saying, please go on to your Moodle site, chat to the rest of us about this. Because the course 
has got so many elements online, especially now with this week, you've got the opportunities to be able to share your learning with us in the forum zones on Moodle. Thanks so much for listening.